Well, that was a wonderful service of, of music. We sure appreciate our young people leading out, A.B. giving the children's story, and, and uh, all those who have been involved um, in our worship today. I want to say a prayer before I begin. Heavenly Father, we just continue in this moment of worship right now. And Lord, we want to hear from your voice as we have already heard from your spirit as we've sung and we've prayed and we've given and we've listened. And Father, now as the word is opened and we discuss the message today, Father, may it be your voice heard here once more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, uh, I changed my sermon title about 10 times this week, and by the time I got it to Betty, uh, made a little, little error in it. Um, the bulletin says falling on the rocks, plural, but my intent was falling on the rock, singular, because there's only one rock, and that's Jesus Christ. So uh, that's my fault, though, and it's just part of the development process of getting my thoughts together. I am going to continue for a couple more messages on the theme of forgiveness this week, and then the very last Sabbath of the month on September 30 uh, will be the last on that topic and theme. And then that evening we have a communion service. So um, I'm going to be talking about David and Bathsheba today, and then we're going to go through Psalm 51 uh, on September 30. And I think that's going to be a beautiful, a beautiful time of looking at that psalm as we prepare our hearts for communion. So just want you to be aware of that as we move forward. Uh, this was a tough one to put together, uh, and, and it's going to take me uh, a little bit of gymnastics to get this entire story to, 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 to work together. So pray for me uh, as we go, because this is a, a tremendous uh, biblical story that deserves careful analysis and thought. I, I took my title from this statement of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, and it's it found a few other places, but in Luke it says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken, or even the word shattered, will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And suffice to say that Jesus is that rock, and He is saying, anyone who falls on me will be broken. But He means that in a good way. He means it in a way that we need to be broken so that God can remake us because the way in which we are, apart from the work of God, is fragile and it does not have the character and the beauty and the creativity that God wants us to have. So just like in baptism, we had a baptism last week. Baptism is both a symbol of death by going down into the water, holding your breath, being laid down into the water, but then it is of resurrection coming up out of the water. So the same idea is characterized in this whole idea that sometimes we need to fall on the rock. We need to die. We need to be broken. We need to be shattered. And that rock is Jesus Christ. He is that stable foundation. He is that unchangeable reality that we need to interact with. But the breaking process can sometimes be a challenge and then uh, other elements here. Jesus actually is, is using Old Testament uh, uh, ideas here. It's not moving, guys. He's quoting or he's using the illusion of other Old Testament passages, such as this one in Isaiah. Uh, it is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. He shall be your fear. He shall be your dread. And again, that sounds like a bad thing. Oh, I mean, I mean, we need to fear the Lord. We need to dread him. But the very next statement that Jesus says is, then he shall become to you a sanctuary. When you understand who God is and when you have that appropriate reverence, that appropriate fear, that appropriate dread, you will find security. You will find sanctuary. You will find safety in knowing who God is and who you are in relationship to God. And then he uses this very uh, imagery of the stone. But to the houses of Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And again, at first reading, you say, well, those are bad things. I don't want to get struck. I don't want to get broken. I don't want to stumble. I don't want to be caught in a snare or a trap. But whenever the Lord traps you, it's a good thing. Not a single agreement out there. I, I must have messed up when I said that. I'm going to come to this side because maybe there's more knowledge over here. When God traps you, it's because He's trying to get your attention, and that's a good thing. Ah! Uh, fished for it a little, but you did well. Thank you. 
And so just to get us into this, this flow, into the story, there are times when we need to fall and be broken on the rock of Jesus Christ. There are times when we need to be snared by his mercy and trapped by his grace. This is the story of David and Bathsheba. And I've been talking about and going through some of the major stories or some of the more popular stories of forgiveness in the Bible, and no analysis of forgiveness would be complete if we were to ignore this story. I've kind of saved it for last on purpose. Other stories have wonderful uh, applications and we can appreciate them. But if you're going to say we're going to take a, a, a kind of a full biblical look at, at stories of forgiveness, you got to address this one at some point. And it's a doozy. It's serious. It's a challenge. And we won't have time in one sermon to look at every single element. And that's that's where uh, we're going to have to make some choices. I do have an interactive quiz, though, for our young people. And these are important questions in preparing us. Can we go black? And I think pink was working pretty good. So my son, Toby, is going to help out. And uh, I think Mitch. So um, now some of these, for you young people and you kids, just raise your hand. We'd love to have you uh, help with the quiz. Um, we'll have someone bring a mic to you so that it can be heard. So those watching at home... Uh, can, it can be heard and recorded. You may not know, so you're willing to guess, but you know, sometimes there, people had more than one wife in the Bible, and David was one of those. Do you know how many he had? Maybe just two or three guesses. Andre, Andre's like, yeah, I got it. Three. He says three. Owen, you are uh, not going to be allowed to participate, young man, because he has my slides. I know, it's, it's sometimes we got to be broken, Owen. Couple more. Andre said three. Isaiah over here. Four. Four. Wow. Now not four. All right, Dylan over here. We got the Osenias are all over the place. Where are you, Osenia? <laughs> Come on, right, Dylan. Two. Oh, he's going down. He says two. Maybe one or two more because this I know if you haven't looked at it, right? I thought it was like seven hundred or something. Seven hundred? Poor man. No, that would be that would be Solomon later. So that's uh, <laughs> okay. Last one because we're just gonna have to keep going. Who is that back there? Wait, wait. Uh, six. Six. Who was that? I can't see. Sorry, Maya. I keep moving the other way. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So we again, if you don't haven't really looked at it, you may not know. He had at least ten or more than ten. Okay, we don't know because there's verses like this that just said he kept on marrying them. We don't, you know, he already, and by the way, I emphasize the word more. He took on more concubines and wives. And we don't have time to talk about the difference between concubines and wives in the ancient context and culture. Suffice to say, a concubine was a wife. In every uh, uh, way, a concubine was a wife with two exceptions. They did not pay a dowry and they did not have a marriage ceremony. But in every other way, the children of a concubine were equal inheritors. The children of a concubine could be the successor to the throne. The, the, a concubine was part of the, the family uh, and ate as a wife. So we don't have time to go into all those differences. But we know at this point, at this point in 2 Samuel 5, there are seven named wives of, of David. And there were at least two concubines before this verse. So by the time Bathsheba is married and, and other things happen, he, he had over 10. So we're going to leave it at that. And, uh, and by the way, polygamy was not all about sexuality either. This was not a harem in that type of a sense. Many marriages were political or for state reasons and, and things like that. But be that as it may, David had many wives. Bathsheba's first husband was known as Uriah the gentle, the hump, horrible, the giant, or the Hittite? Abel. The Hittite. Boy, did you, he got that right off. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, Dylan, he got it. So we're just going to have to give it to, to Abel in the back. He was not a Jew. <laughs> and sometimes we might forget this in the story. And not only was he not a Jew, there are so many people groups in the Bible that we begin to kind of 
filter them out. You know, there was the Girgashites and there was the Horavites and there was the Parasites and there was the Amorites and all these ites. Most of those are incredibly small local tribal peoples. They control one small territory or maybe even just one city. The Hittites were not that. The Hittites were one of the great powers and mighty empires of the ancient empire. They rivaled Egypt at their height. In their, in their power and their influence. Now, by the time of David, the Hittite kingdom had faded significantly, but it's just interesting. Uriah comes from a mighty people, and yet in the story of David and Bathsheba, it will be Uriah who has greater integrity to God, a convert to, Jer- to Judaism, a convert to the God of Israel, instead of the king of Israel himself. So it's just good to have context when we, we're talking about people. How many commandments I have five questions, by the way, for Mitch and, and Toby. How many commandments did David break when he sinned with Bathsheba? Couple? Seventeen? No, wait. There's only, only ten. That's the limit. So we've got some young people here. Uh, Dylan, or, or David. Yeah, David. All ten. He says all ten. Dylan, what do you say? Seven. Seven. Well, that's a, that's a number two. Oh, Abel in the back? Seven. Another seven. Okay, we've got some on seven, David. I don't know. You're kind of getting outvoted here. One, maybe one or two others. Okay, I see. Uh, Gio? Five. five. He says five. Okay, Isaiah, last one. Ten all. Ten all. <laughs> well, you know, anytime you break a command, the Bible says we've broken them all. So in a general sense, every sin is a violation of the spirit of the entire Decalogue. But if you carefully look and analyze the story of David and Bathsheba, he will specifically violate all ten commands. There's no generality about it. And even the Sabbath command, you say, what does the Sabbath have to do with it? Remember, David is not called to account until after the child is born. So for at least nine months, David will keep every Sabbath. The, The principle of the Sabbath is to keep it holy. And to live by the character of God. For every Sabbath he kept over those nine months, he was living a lie in violation of God's character. So even the Sabbath, we would say David had brought into guilt. Who was the prophet God sent to David? Very important. Can't forget this guy. Who was the prophet? What was his name? A.B.'s got her hand up. Nathan. She got it. Now, did Abel tell you that? (laughs) Right from here. I got it. Right there. It was Nathan. And most of the times you look for a picture of Nathan, you see this kind of elderly, prophetic-looking guy pointing at the king. Thou art the man. You are the one. That's not how I picture Nathan, though. I picture Nathan like this. I just do. Now, I know some people hate Veggie Tales. And some things they do very poorly, but some things they do quite well. And I have to say King George and the Ducky was one of the more creative and uh, uh, good ways to teach the children a story that deals with such adult themes. So anyways, that's how I picture Nathan. Last question, and this will be just, if you know it, you know it. And if not, maybe you can guess. What does Nathan mean? The name Nathan. By the way, the name Jonathan, Nathaniel. Nathan, they all have the same meaning. And the name Matthew, although it's a different derivation, Nat- Matthew, they all mean the same thing. What does Nathan... Now, were you just looking it up on Google, Dylan? See, I, <laughs> this, is, this is the new world we live in, you know? Just, you can just cheat right in church. Gio. Gift of God. Give, how did you know that? Me, my, I have a friend in my class named Matthew, and he searched it up. What does so it mean he, in the Bible? You, you listened in class. This is an excellent young man here. I like it. He did, if you didn't catch it, uh, thank you, Mitch and Toby. Thank you to all you young people. Sorry if I missed anyone. The name, the, the literal name Nathan, and we have Jonathan here somewhere, unless he went home. He taught Sabbath school. And I was wondering if any of our other Nathans might be here. But the name Nathan means gift of God. So literally, as the story of David and Bathsheba progresses... When it says in in 2 Samuel 12, then the Lord sent Nathan. He literally was sending someone whose name means this is a gift from God. 
He who falls on the rock shall be shattered, shall be broken. And that's a gift from God. So we're going to get into the story. Now, David is not the worst sinner ever, and his sins are not the worst sins ever. There have been war criminals throughout history guilty for the murder of millions. There have been mass murderers that do grotesque things and shooters. There have been cultic leaders like David Koresh and Jim Jones and Charles Manson who, you know, convince people to do heinous things. But what is interesting and I think applicable to the story of Bathsheba is that their story is more relatable to us. Very few times do you say, I'm, I'm kind of having a Hitler-like day today. I just, I just want to murder millions. If you're having those days, please talk to me. We need to work. Very few people say, I'm kind of having a Jim Jones day today. I want to convince hundreds of people to commit suicide, right? We, we don't relate with these grotesque, absolutely horrendous people throughout history. Hopefully, we don't relate with them. But every single one of us can relate. As a man, you can relate with lust, As a woman, you can relate with lust. In different ways, she lusted for power, he lusted for the flesh. Every one of us can relate with trying to cover up a lie and going to extreme measures. Now, we may not have gone and done the acts that David and Bathsheba did, but we know the temptation. So while they're not the greatest sinners ever, their sins that they take to the level they do are relatable to every single one of us. And so this story is not just a far off. When you, when you hear the tragic stories of other sinners, you say, that's just gross and what happened there was awful, but I can't relate to it. We can relate to them. And this is why God did not shield us from this story. One of the greatest reasons that we know of the inspiration of Scripture is because God does not hide this story from His people. God didn't have to include this. There would have been other things that David did that were wrong that we don't know about. But the inspiration of God came into the scribe as he began to write. And he says, we've got to write this down for every future generation to know, even though it's a horrible, horrible story. So it's there for our learning and our edification. Now, I know many of you know this story already. I'm going to go through it. We're not going to go verse by verse. There's two chapters we're going to look at. We're going to touch on the highlights just to remind ourselves of what this story is all about. David is not, the the kingdom of Israel is at war, not a major war, but there's always some little skirmish. So the army of Israel is out fighting, but David's back home in Jerusalem, and he happens upon seeing a woman. And it's not a passing glance. He lingers in that glance. He sees her in an exposed manner, and his flesh begins to arise in him, but it begins with him seeing. And don't miss that. Many of the major stories of fallenness and sin begin with the eyes. Eve saw that the fruit of the, of the tree looked good. Uh, Lot looked and he saw that the cities of the, of, the, of, of the Dead Sea, the cities of the Jordan, they looked like the Garden of Eden. Jacob deceived his father when Isaac could not see Peter, when he was walking on water, says that when he saw the waves, he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. The eyes are a window through which the devil can convince us to make poor decisions. And David sees something, and he does not resist it. David had convinced himself that he was God's gift to women. And he had every right to do what he wanted to do. So he inquires about the woman that he saw. Now, it's unlikely that David did not know who Bathsheba was. Uriah was one of David's inner counsel. Uriah was like one of the knights of the round table. All right? He was one of the mighty men, David's 30, that fought closest to David. The idea that David had no idea who Bathsheba was before this time, pretty unlikely. But he had, maybe he didn't see her clearly, or maybe when someone's naked, they look different. I, I thought that might get a laugh. Ken, that thought, maybe. But he says, who is she? And the servants say to him, is this not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? Even the servants can see that David is headed down a difficult path. And they say, look, you got these 10 ladies already. She's already married. But David says, I, that's, I, I am king 
and I've got this decision that's happening in my head. We're going to move forward. And so the Bible says that the messengers went and they took her. That language is always a bit uh, aggressive. They took her. Now, uh, we, we're, again, we don't have time to go into every detail. Bathsheba is not innocent in this story. Now, you may have read books. You may have studied it. You may have come to a different conclusion. But the, the clear thrust of this is that while she is secondary, she is not the primary motivator of the sin. She is a willing participant. She is not upheld as a victim or innocent. She makes a decision in this story as well, okay? Secondary, okay, to David, but it was her choice. So David takes, and they have intimacy together. And you know that it only takes one time to get pregnant. David at this time had at least 20 children, maybe 30. At this time, David has no problem making babies, all right? And it only takes one time, and through the creative, procreative gift of God that He has given to all of us, despite the fact that this was outside of God's boundaries, the, the, the miracle of life is conceived in the womb of Bathsheba. And she says, the only word she says in the entire story come when she sends message to David, she says, I am with child. Now, at this point, David panics. Well, I, I guess I already hit the panic button. David panics. He knows that he is now in violation of God's law. God, he had been in, 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 in a, a very, obviously, we know David. This is a guy who killed Goliath, and he stood against you know, Saul and wouldn't allow Saul to be killed because he's the Lord anointed. David is, is closer to God than just about anyone at the time in which he's living. But he knows that he has done this devastating thing, guilty of uh, the, the guilt of adultery by Mosaic law. The punishment was death. The punishment was death. So not only does he feel uh, uh, shame for his conduct and the possibility of, of his losing his, his crown, his life is also in jeopardy if this is to be discovered. All right? So he panics, but then he begins to scheme. I'm going to bring Uriah back, and I'm going to convince Uriah to go down and, and visit his wife so that when the baby comes, everyone will say, Ah, oh, it's Uriah's baby. So he brings Uriah back from battle, and he has this fake conversation. How goes the war? How's every, is everyone okay? Joab, all right? All right. Well, good to hear it, Uriah. Uh, now go, go home, relax, have a meal, visit Bathsheba. Won't you do that for me? Uriah says, absolutely not. He goes out and he sleeps among the servants of David. David is outraged. What are you doing, Uriah? I told you to go home. And Uriah makes this beautiful statement of faith. He says, Joab and the ark and the army of Israel are dwelling in tents. How be it that I should come and have this moment with my wife? That would be totally inappropriate. By the way, it was part of military code in Israel's day that during warfare, the men must remain abstinent. Okay, that was just their, their military code. They were not allowed, kind of like when Rocky is training, you know, to fight Apollo Creed. You got to stay abstinent. And so Uriah says, I will not do this thing. David gets so frustrated, but then he schemes again. He says, I know, I'll get him drunk. Because when you're drunk, you, you lose your power of judgment. When you're drunk, you do things you wouldn't normally do. So he gets Uriah drunk. And even when Uriah is drunk, he shows greater integrity than when David does sober. Because even drunk, Uriah says, I will not do this thing. So then David says, I, I don't know what else to do. I can't admit this. I can't do anything else. I've got to remove the problem. And I have an idea. We're at war. And Uriah is a soldier. And you know, soldiers die in war. So what I'm going to do, I write, I'm going to write a letter to the, to the commander, Joab. Uh, Joab, uh, there's going to be a battle. I want you to put Uriah at the front of the battle and then have everyone retreat. Make sure that Uriah dies. Now notice how this sin continues to build. Not only has David sinned and brought Bathsheba into sin, the servants that are around him are now having to, to live this lie of sin. Now Joab has been brought into his sin. Now that crusty old general Joab did what David asked, but as we know from the Nazis at Nuremberg, just saying I did it because my commander told me to do it is not an excuse. Joab becomes a participant in the murder of Uriah. And it is not an excuse to say, well, the king said I have to do it, so I have to do it. Joab now is partnering with David in this murder. 
led by David. So they, they, they get the scheme together. The soldiers attack. They attack the wall. They all draw back. Uriah is killed. But the, but the writer of 2 Samuel says, but also many other soldiers of Israel died in that attack. So not only is Joab now a participant, but now other families in Israel are grieving at the death of their sons because of the foolishness and sin of David. It's just, this is like a a Shakespearean tragedy with a a daytime soap opera with a a shameless, you know, reality show mixed with a tawdry romantic novel. It is just a mess. I know nothing about any of those, by the way. I've heard rumors, but I don't know anything about them. It's an absolute mess, but David thinks, okay, I I think I've succeeded. No one's going to know what happens. I'm going to marry Bathsheba. So after a time of grieving, he marries her, trying to make it look like this developing. Maybe she even had a little bit of a bump by this time, because as you add up the sequence of things that had to have happened, we're not talking days or weeks here, probably months. And the Bible says that the, the child was born, but 2 Samuel 11 ends with, the Lord saw, and he was not happy. The thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now comes chapter 12. Enter a new character, Nathan. Nathan, the gift of God. Again, David, who had convinced himself that he was the gift of God, God sent someone else who was the true gift of God. The Lord sent Nathan. Notice the Lord sent Nathan. How many of you would like to be Nathan? We'll talk about that. You remember in the story he gives this parable Now, David is a king, he's a warrior, he's a poet, but he was also a shepherd. He grew up as a shepherd. And so in the wisdom of God, in the irony of of the plan of God, he gives him an analogy or a story of a rich man who was a shepherd who had lots of sheep. But then there was this poor man who just had one lamb, but he loved the lamb. He treated the lamb like his own daughter, it says. And when the rich man wanted to feed a guest who had come, he did not choose from his own flock, but he stole the one little lamb from the poor man, and he slaughtered that lamb in order to feed his guest. Now, David doesn't know that this is a parable. He thinks Nathan is like reporting the news to him. David flies into a wrath. Now, notice, David as a young man was willing to lay down his life for his flock. He fought a lion. He fought a bear. He was willing as a good shepherd to fight for his flock. So when he hears about someone who's been violated this way, he flies into a wrath. Oh, I I wanted to point out the then. Then the Lord. Now, there's a little bit of, of debate about this. This is the day of his son's birth. If you follow the transition between chapter 11 and chapter 12, it says, then Bathsheba had the child, then the Lord sent it. So this is on the day his child has been born, just for context. He flies into this rage, and he pronounces the death penalty for whoever this was who slaughtered that lamb. Think about that. While he doesn't seem to have issues slaughtering his own people to hide his shame, he wants to proclaim the death penalty for someone who'd done a wicked thing, to be sure, but at the end of the day, it was a lamb that was slain. But he pronounces the death penalty, and then you have the the mighty reveal and the judgment when Nathan says, if you want to proclaim the death penalty, look in the mirror, buddy, because it's you. And then Nathan begins to proclaim, you know, all the things that God has judged and, and, the, and the result, excuse me, the result of what would happen because of David's sin. David is shocked. David is ashamed. And, and again, uh, because we, ha- we lack time to go into it, David confesses. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And the very next statement of Nathan is, the Lord has taken away your sin. It seems very rapid and quick that that little transition could happen. But it does illustrate that for a time, David had been brooding over this. David had been struggling with this. And at this moment, Nathan was the catalyst that, Na- that David needed to get him to the point of repentance. But the judgment is declared. 
Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. Now, of all the things I have tried to uh, summarize or skip over, I felt like I couldn't just skip over this because it is so uh, dramatic. And it raises deep theological questions. Why should the innocent suffer for the guilty? Why did the son that was a result of this affair, why should the son die? Why shouldn't it be some other process? And you have to, and again, there's so many different ways of analyzing this and struggling with it, but you have to remember the code of God, the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, uh, the, the law of retaliation was that whatever offense you do to someone else, that equal offense should be measured unto you. David had made other people childless. David had stolen away the children of others. Uriah's parents lost their child. And the others that were, dead, that were killed in that foolish attack, those parents also lost their children. So in the just system of that eye for an eye, it was necessary for God to put equal punishment on David as he had made others childless, so he too would lose a child. Now this is, again, not in our modern sensibilities and in our modern code of justice. There's other things that we could struggle with. But I also want you to know this. It was God who gave that child life. And it was God who took that child's life away. And if you remember the story of Job, when Job lost everything, he said, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, before I go on for this, when the child dies, where is that child right now? If you're a Seventh-day Adventist believer, that child is sleeping. That child is sleeping, awaiting the resurrection. David will be reunited with this child, will he not? So this is not a total loss. This is not a condemnation. This is not as though that child was forgotten and neglected. That child is part of God's creative will. And that child will be in heaven at the redemption and the resurrection. Amen? So it's difficult. It's visceral. It's painful. Now notice something else here. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. And again, this is, this is sometimes hard to reconcile. What? Why did God give seven days? Why not? You're going to lose the child. The child, you know, like when the the angel of death strikes the, the firstborn of Egypt, they died that night. But David grieves and prays for that child for seven days. Now, again, that might seem like torture, like God was just torturing him. But I want to I want to offer you a perspective on this in two ways. One, if this child was born on the day that Nathan came to him, then the seventh day would have been either the seventh day from his birth, or it could have been the seventh day from when Nathan talked to him, meaning it would have been the eighth day. Now, some of you remember in your Bible study that it was on the eighth day that a male child would be circumcised, dedicated to God, and named. Also, before the the Levitical priesthood, God had designated that the firstborn of every family had to be given to God for the priesthood on the eighth day. So before the eighth day or around the time of the eighth day, God reclaims the life of this child. He says, this child now belongs to me. He's no longer your child. I am taking back what I have given on the, along with the system that I've given on the eighth day. The other thing that I find interesting is in the ritual cleansing for lepers and in the ritual cleansing for um, a house that needed to be uh, ritually cleansed, it was on the eighth day that a lamb was sacrificed to signify that a leper had been cleansed or a house had been cleansed. So on the seventh day or about the eighth day, the cleansing of David's house was symbolically manifested by the death of his son. Now, we're going to come back to this uh, just briefly, but there's one more element I want to share with you on this um, that came to me many years ago in the 90s. (laughs) Many years ago, um, I was watching a program, um, and uh, this has just never left my thinking. Now, this this is a topic in the context of abortion, Uh, But I don't want to let that draw you into one emotional camp or the other. Um, I just want you to hear this story 
um, and it's a true story, and how I, I, I think it may relate to this issue of the seven days. There was a woman who was pregnant, and the doctor said that the child has a big problem. It's very tragic, very sad, but that child will not live if you let it be born. You need to abort it. She did not want to have that abortion. She struggled with it. She said, I don't know, maybe I should get a second opinion. Finally, she decides, okay, I better have the abortion. But where she was living at that time, she had passed the line when it was legally allowed to have an abortion. So she was forced to carry the baby to, to, um, to term and have the baby. This be, by the way, if you look it up, this was a national scandal in the 90s. You can watch the testimony. You can, you can hear all the reports about it because it was a big deal, as abortion is in America, always a big deal. So she actually gets called to testify about her experience. Now, again, wherever side you are in abortion, this was her her experience. They put her on the witness stand, and they said, tell us about what happened. And it went very different than what anyone thought was going to happen. And this is, this is pretty close to verbatim, pr- pretty close to exactly what she said. She said, I held my son for 27 minutes. For 27 minutes, I felt his heartbeat. For 27 minutes, I could hear him breathing. For 27 minutes, I could look into his eyes, and he could look into my eyes. For, seven, for 27 minutes, I felt a love I have never experienced before, and I will never trade that moment for anything in this world, because for 27 minutes, I got to experience the life of my child. Now, you may feel different. Others may have a different experience, but at least in some cases, people having an opportunity to be with their child means an enormous blessing to them. I believe it was out of mercy that God allowed that child to live for seven days. I think it gave David and Bathsheba opportunity to grieve with that child, to be with that child, an opportunity that David never gave the family of Uriah. An opportunity that never gave the David never gave the family of those other soldiers that died. But I believe it's in God's mercy that He allowed them to experience those few moments with that child. Not out of anger or out of torture. If you understand the heart and love of God, you can see that God had a plan in all these things. But tragically, no, notice this. Notice this. The innocent son of David died that David's sins could be forgiven. The innocent son of David died that David's sins could be forgiven. That child in that moment is a type of Christ. Because Jesus was an innocent son of David who died that our sins could be forgiven. Do you follow? It's a terrible, tragic situation and story. Now, again, I encourage you to, you know, if you have other elements of this story that, 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 that still need to be uh, examined and explained, you know, read it, talk about it, pray about it. I'm just going to give one, one perspective on how God manifested forgiveness in this story. How did and how could God forgive David? And in all the other stories we've looked at, the woman caught in adultery and and, and, uh, Joseph forgiving his brothers, God does something unique in this story, and I think it has to do with the the, the seriousness of who David was and what he did. How could God forgive David? What if there had been no Nathan? There was no Nathan with Joseph and his brothers. There was no Nathan with the woman caught in adultery. There was no Nathan with the, the, the cripple who was brought to Jesus on his bed. There is an intercessor here. How would this story be different if there was no Nathan? Where would David be now? (laughs) Or how would the story of David end differently, we might say? 
the role of Nathan in this story is profound. If not, but Nathan. Now, Nathan, some of us, <clears throat> again, David thought he was God's gift to women. Nathan was God's gift to David. Some of us think we are God's gift to the church to point out other people's sins, right? Oh, I hear you eat the pepperoni. Uh, you know, I just need to tell you, God has sent me to tell you're going to hell. And I say that in love. I've been sent to you, right? Some of us think that God has given us the, the Nathan gift. But I want you to notice this. For years, Nathan had been established in David's house and in David's court as a trusted advisor and friend. He wasn't just some random guy walking around looking for judgment. Oh, oh, you're not wearing the right thing over there. Oh, I see you eating the wrong thing. Oh, are you sure that's okay to do on Sabbath? That, that wasn't Nathan at all. Nathan was part of the trusted inner circle. He was one of the few who had earned the right to speak truth to David. And so often when we want to take on the role of Nathan, we have not earned that right. It's out of our own self-righteousness. I want you to also notice something. Nathan literally risked his life when he went to David. David had already proven he was willing to murder to cover up this sin. The whole point of the parable and the wrath of David that lashes out, he once again proclaims murder. It would have been murder if David had found the guy that had actually stolen that lamb and if David had said, off with his head, that was not appropriate. He was already showing murderous tendencies and behavior. Nathan literally was willing to die to follow God's plan and speak to David. He risked his life. Are you willing to put your life on the line if God calls on you to hold someone accountable for their sins? He offered God's judgment and forgiveness. Very simple. Anytime someone is offering you advice about your life, if they only offer you judgment, it's not from God. Are you hearing me, church? Anytime someone just wants to point out your faults, but not show you Jesus and not show you grace, that is not God's message for you. And anytime you want to go to someone or you feel God has called you to go to someone and point out their faults, if you're not equally and abundantly pouring on the mercy and grace of God, shut your mouth! You are not the agent of God. Should I start preaching again? That is the flesh, and that's so destructive. Nathan offered God's mercy in the midst of this story. Your sins have been given. He stayed with David from through the entire circumstance because right after David's son dies, the next story is that David comforts his wife and she has Solomon. And it's Nathan who comes and blesses Solomon and gives him the Lord's name, which was Jedidiah, beloved of the Lord. Nathan stuck with David throughout that entire circumstance. Nathan was there with David when his son died. Nathan was there throughout all of the trials. He stuck with him. He was God's gift. He blesses Solomon. And notice this. Nathan has such a profound impact on David's life, he names one of his sons Nathan. Look at this from Chronicles. These were born to David in Jerusalem, Shemaiah, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon by Bathsheba. He literally names one of the sons that comes from Bathsheba after this incident by his trusted friend who was willing to put his life on the line to bring to him that rock that would shatter him. But in that moment, God would use it to rebuild him. David names a son, Nathan. Isn't that amazing? You think that's just an accident? You think he just had a limit of names? I've already got 38 kids. I'm running out of names. Um, how about Nathan? He names a son after Nathan. 
Nathan was God's agent of forgiveness. Do not despise your friends, your trusted companions, when they offer you God's gift of advice. Hey, man, I know you're struggling with internet porn. What can I do to help you? Shut up. That's none of your business. All right, but I'm there for you. Hey, I, I hear that you're making some decisions, and I just want to help you. Do you despise it when God sends people into your life? When he needs you to see that the direction of your life is disastrous. God justly punished David and Bathsheba as part of their forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean all consequences are eliminated. As part of the forgiveness process, God had to bring reconciliation with the house of David. And the innocent son of David becomes a model for how all our sins are forgiven. That child is a type of Christ. As Jesus died for all of our sins to pay the price. And it's at that rock, at that rock, we need to fall and we need to allow the grace and mercy of Jesus to snare us, to grab us, to hold us, and to remake us into the people he wants us to be. Don't be afraid of that rock. Let that rock be the foundation on which God recreates you. Is there more that we can learn from the story of David and Bathsheba? Absolutely. I think this is going to be an incredible element of our spiritual journey, even into the kingdom. And one day we'll be able to hear David himself and Bathsheba tell the story. But we can relate to it. We should relate to it. And we should learn from it. Are you thankful that God is able to forgive even to the uttermost? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I know that there is so, so much more that you intend for us to learn and grow from in this story. And the role of Nathan is so profound to me, Father, and the tragedy of the judgment that falls upon David's house. And we only looked at just portions of that, Lord. But from the ashes of this terrible and tragic decision of this highly exalted king, we see hope. We see that even our sins can also be forgiven. Sometimes we have to pay the price for the devastating decisions that we've made. But ultimately, Lord, we take great courage and faith from knowing that your son died, that our sins could be forgiven. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you send us gifts to remind us of our great need for you. Help us to continue learning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.